back guys today i'm with the radical reviewer um you can check out his youtube channel he reviews a lot of um radical uh, philosophical works and books um would you like to intru- would you like to introduce yourself um yeah so i'm the radical reviewer uh i'm a dog on youtube i review mostly books i just did a review of anarchy works by peter gerdeloos Uh, I recently did a review of Atlas Shrugged and kind of tried to expose its sort of uh, the fascist worldview it promotes rather than the sort of libertarian worldview it's thought to promote. I've reviewed uh, Conquest of Bread, ABC of Anarchism, Anarchism and Other Essays, uh, The Shock Doctrine, lots of stuff. So if someone's told you, you know, go read the Bread book or um, if someone's, if you've seen Google Murray Bookchin or something, you know, I've I've probably covered a video on it. So what would you kind of broadly define radical philosophy to be, both on like kind of the left and right uh, side of the political spectrum and beyond? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's interesting that you say that because that is something that was kind of on my, has been on my mind recently. So I heard a interview with um, the guy who wrote uh, Ishmael, the, the story about like the talking gorilla that explains like how civilization is bad or whatever. Okay. And, and uh, in that interview, the interviewer asked about radicalism, and he said, you know, well, you think about the radicalism in its, um, you know, it, phonically, like, or whatever. The, the word radical means, like, to the root. So, like, trying to get to the root of problems. So rather mm-hmm. than sort of having, um, you know, maybe more, more liberal solutions for things like uh, energy-efficient cars, you might want to find more radical solutions like... Um, Ener- uh, renewable energy mass transit or something mm-hmm. that gets to a little more of the root of the problem. So I think of whether you're on the left or the right, you know, radical thought is about, about getting down into the roots of the problems and trying, and trying to address them in a very significant way, whether you're like a libertarian that says there should be absolutely no government or something and only capitalism, or if you're like more of an anarcho-communist like myself who says, you know, we need to have more decentralized organizations you know, maybe worker control of uh, the work, democratic worker control of the workplace or something to get at the root of, uh, of some of the problems we see in society. So it, it kind of sounds like the more uh, radical or um, unique or peculiar the solu- or the, the problems we face, the more kind of radical the solutions need to be, the more kind of creative and potentially disruptive. Is that kind of the... Yeah, I, yeah, I would say okay. that for sure. Okay. Um, and you also mentioned you're an anarcho-communist. Um, I'm not incredibly familiar with all of the different like strands of communism or Marxism. Um, and uh, would you be able to just give uh, some, some clarity over exactly what an anarcho-communist would stand for? Um, <laughs> that's like a big whole thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, to like maybe explain it sort of as, as briefly as possible is like... Um, there's, there's two sort of Marxist uh, books, State and Revolution by Lenin and Critique of the Gotha Program by Marx, both of which I covered on my channel, subtle plug. Um, <laughs> but they talk about the, the ways in which a you know, worker control of the, of the government, proletarian control of the government, you know, how they would use state power to achieve those ends. And there seemed to be this this break where kind of the more, you know, Leninist or, or Stalinist or whatever type uh, folks believed that the, um, the strength of the state was needed to uh, impose this new uh, worldview where someone more like um, Alexander Berkman or Kropotkin, a more, more anarchist worldview would say, you know, those people simply recreated like a, a state capitalism or, or they recreated like a state authority so, you know, it would be better to try and break up that hierarchical structure um, to run things, you know, more, more decentralized that you kind of, you somewhat need to, um, you know, in, in an ends justify the means sense, you need to uh, live your, your values, create, um, you know, when you're fighting for an alternative world, you need to be embracing that um, alternative as you do it, you know. So if you want to create a... Uh, if you want to create a world free of uh, sexism, free of uh, racial suppression, then your movement should embody those uh, goals and strive for those things, you know, as you enact it. If you want a stateless society, you should 
fight using the structures that a stateless society would enact, if that makes sense. So, I because th I think one of the, the kind of common counter arguments to, I think, anarchist philosophy in general, and I guess Marxism, is um, it seems like it's like an idealized form of human nature that kind of goes against the sort of capitalist, people are greedy or self-interested. Um, and, and I think that's why people usually justify state involvement is because there needs to be or they argue there needs to be a sort of top-down control that kind of um, uh, incentivizes people to act better, um, maybe in, in the more kind of uh, state authoritarian uh, manifestations of communism or socialism. Um, so what what exactly is the anarcho-communist conception of like human motivation and human nature? Um. Yeah, so you, you saw, I'm sure, the uh, Jordan Peterson uh, Slavoj Žižek debate, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so in that, you know, Peterson brought up this, this um, classic kind of critique that, you know, Marxists and socialists and stuff, they have this very idealist view of the worker that, you know, if the workers are in control, they're going to run everything perfectly. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, this, this Christ-like view of, of the working class is, you know, not accurate and I think uh, movies like uh, the movie Parasite you know handled this quite well where it is the working class people that are a little bit more crass a little bit more crafty but then you know in the in the movie spoilers uh, for the movie Parasite but you know they're they're sitting at the table and they say something like you know the wealthier family can afford to be nice mm, yeah <laughs> which I think is um, you know can be quite accurate but I, I think that um, uh, an example that I that I've brought up recently is like you can have a video game like um, Last of Us or something that that speaks to the um, selfishness and and the the dog eat dog nature of of human nature and you know you can buy into it quite well or if you play any like online uh, video game and people are like uh, team killing the whole time or like blowing you up when you're in the middle of trying to do something you know it can really feel like yeah humans are just jerks. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you could play something like um, Ark uh, or Minecraft or Don't Starve, which really exposes the ways in which you know those games. You only win if you if you work together. You can accomplish so much more if you say, you know, okay, my character is going to go collect wood. Your character should go collect stone. That way, when we come back, we have enough of you know each product that we can build you know a house that has like a working furnace or whatever. And you you. Six, you succeed in the game better when you divide things up in that way. And I think that that's a little bit more in tune with uh, a human nature that exists sort of outside the, or despite of the, the motivations of capitalism and, and stabbing each other in the back to get ahead or whatever. So it's more about kind of creating a system that um, brings about these already existent, like already present more positive, uh, altruistic, and uh, communitarian aspects of human nature, um, rather than perhaps capitalism that brings about more of the uh, selfish or like self-oriented um, uh, aspects of human nature. If, yeah. If, if I'm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'll give I'll give an example. Is like uh, right now, uh, currently, I work as a as a dishwasher at a grocery store, and there's mm -hmm. aspects of that job that are sort of influenced by capitalism that like, you know, I need to really make sure that I am achieving as much per hour as, you know, other people, otherwise my hours are gonna get cut. I need, you know, and it can kind of form this like race to the bottom and stuff. Like there's capitalist influences that take hold because we live in a broader capitalist economy. But at the same time, if the manager comes to like my section of, of the grocery store and is like, you know, hey, we need to uh, clean the floors and do a trash run. Can you guys, you know, handle that before the store closes? Then, you know, me and the surrounding coworkers are like, okay, you know, I'll help you with this, you help you with this. And, you know, we come together to achieve the task. It's not that it was like, um, you know, authoritarianly dictated to us. We came together and, you know, the, created something, uh, you know, better than the sum of our parts by, you know, distributing things and deciding, you know, well, I, I'm prefer sweeping to doing this part, so I'll handle this. If you prefer this, you know, the floor mats are really heavy, so maybe this larger, you know, co-worker should do that part. Mm. Um, so yeah, okay. I mean, we work together, all, like, uh, 
people who live with roommates, people who do like a D&D campaign, people who, I mean, you know, this, what we're engaged in right now, I mean, is somewhat of a representative of, you know, anarchist mutual aid in action. You know, I thought that your show is, is very interesting and I reached out to you and we've talked and we're engaged in this activity, you know, mm-hmm. un, uncoercively. Uncor- yeah, no, uh, yeah, that that's an interesting, I, I, I do believe that like that sort of, uh, capitalist uh argument that like marxism is far too idealistic kind of um dismisses the fact that like we are a fairly cooperative species like of course there's um bad things that people do but there's also uh you know it's interesting peterson brings that up as a psychologist because it's well known that uh, psychologically we gravitate towards the worst of news and like you're you're far more likely to be captivated by a video of like some sort of public freak out where somebody's like be acting very selfishly than a video of somebody being very nice like we're going to only really remember people acting really poorly um it just sticks with us more so i wonder if yeah. there's like a little bias bias there perhaps yeah I, w- I was talking about this the other day i said you know um from just like a sort of a uh, distanced uh, point of view, someone can look at the United States and say, you know, um, Joe Biden is like maybe the type of president people would ideally uh, want. You know, he's um, soft uh, spoken and he doesn't push for like too extremely things. He's really willing to compromise. Like on paper, this is like the guy, but he's so boring. Um, mm-hmm. And so the headlines, you know, still like what, six, seven months after Trump is no longer president, the mm-hmm. headlines are still full of Trump because he's just so much more captivating you know even if it's not maybe the the leader that a you know a a disinterested third party would say that's probably the worst of the two options but it's like we gravitate towards the headlines with uh you know that name do you think that uh maybe um i don't know if i can form this question exactly if i wanted to when i had it in my head but do you think maybe that capitalism kind of um has this sort of bias psychologically speaking like it kind of preys on our more uh very like base level innate um interests like uh overly inflammatory um kind of uh, not very well spoken but very loud and dominating like figures um compared to um kind of soft spoken more uh, uh consensus based um agreeable figures do you do you think that 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 there's also like a bias there like it's kind of playing like a um because because it is it is a little bit exhausting you watch like biden speak and it's like uh he says a lot of very nice things it's very kind of uh same tone there isn't really a lot of controversial things being said um and it's also just not very entertaining whereas at least in capitalism or sorry with trump um there is that sort of like he talks like a capitalist he's like extremely like um outspoken very grandiose um and you you do find it captivating like you find it very entertaining um and is it just that either the system that we're entrenched in makes us more like we're kind of socialized to be captivated by people that are more kind of uh aggressive um and I don't mean that in just an authoritarian sense, but also just like pop up ads, like social media influencers, yeah, yeah, yeah. people that like they, they really like just it self endorsement and stuff like that. Um, or do you think that there is something a little bit like instinctive about humans? And maybe this is perhaps why we have kind of selected capitalism as the, the primary mode of, of production um, or has capitalism, I guess, in a sense, selected us for its own sort of means of like socialization in, I guess, a more Deleuzian sense? Uh, I, I think that, like, I think that it could very much appear that way. You know, people will say, like, oh, we're, we're so a- attracted, like like we've been recently saying, uh, so attracted to, like, a reality TV show and the people getting, like, a fist fight or Jerry Springer or musically, you know, we're very attracted to uh, the celebrities and personalities that are deeply entrenched in, in violence and going to the club and, and drugs and stuff that it's so interesting to us. But I think that, um, I think it was Michael Moore who said this, you know, people say that like, oh, if you don't like the movies that are out there, then just make your own movie. And you mm-hmm. can do that. Cameras are pretty affordable. The technology and stuff is all fairly affordable, but we capitalists own, you know, the means of production and distribution. And, you know, you can make, uh, 
you can make a, um, you know, sorry to bother you type movie, but it just might not get the type of distribution that, you know, a Marvel movie is going to get. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, you know, you can point to something like Wolf of Wall Street and say, look, see, this is an exciting type of story we want. This guy that's like getting all this money and all these nice cars and stuff, and he's doing it right under like the Fed's noses. You know, he's kind of this anti-hero, and this is the type of story that people drive to. But I also think, you know, you can make like a, a Robin Hood-esque story that is equally uh, alluring, but there just isn't the, distribu the capitalist distribution behind that kind of story that there might be for something like Wolf of Wall Street. I, I mm. think. Okay, yeah, because I've always been curious about how uh, the entertainment um, industry and pop culture would manifest under like a Marxist um, state. Because I, th I think that the common conception is like, oh, everybody would just be like listening to like classical music and it would be very, um, or at least this kind of general uh, conception of it. Um, because there is something very like um, manufactured and industrialized about um, pop culture, at least under capitalism. Um, has there ever been any like historical examples of what pop culture or I guess it would be art um, would manifest as under like a maybe not like a true communist state, but but something somewhat close to that? Um, so I, I, I suppose I could take this in two directions. One thing that I think about is the way that like a. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union was very uh, sensory and they would like cut out parts of movies and they would, you know, if you were going to be a street performer, you had to uh, perform first in front of like these, you know, state officials to OK your performance before you could mm -hmm. perform it on the street and stuff like that, which um, uh, as someone who's interested in, in art and creative expression and making YouTube videos and, and stuff like that, you know, I find that to be you know, ab abhorrence, but I also, I got my, um, I live in the Pacific Northwest and I got kind of my political uh, intrigue in sort of middle school, high school, uh, early college years when I started really getting interested in political philosophy and stuff like that. I also started getting interested in um, alternative music and, you know, friends that I knew and stuff were starting uh, bands. Mm. And there is uh, a pretty rich, you know, if you live in the right kind of area, I guess, a pretty rich culture of, of house shows and, um, you know, playing at dive bars or whatever, um, where, uh, you know, it's like a house of, I'm, I'm thinking of some friends of mine, they live in a house of like six people, all of them have different bands going on, they have like a recording space, touring bands come and stay with them and stuff, so the, I would say that's almost more of a, there's a lot of mutual aid and uh, stuff mm. going on in, in those circles where the, the shows are, you know, the money that they pool at the show goes to the touring band to help them continue with their tour. The, the bands that live in the area, they don't take any of the money with them. The bands get to stay at the house for free. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, internal uh, promotion and exploration and stuff like that um, so it, that I think is I, very I, fascinating. It would become, I guess, a bit more localized. Like it wouldn't be this kind of mass general production of, uh, like, the same ten songs on like the <laughs> Billboard chart. It would, it would be kind of more like local communities would be creating their own sort of art and music that could be like shared and enjoyed within that area. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, what? Well, because of the internet, I mean, it's all p potentially global. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think, you know, what, what's out there musically can be oh, overwhelming. I think of like, um, I'm trying to just think off the top of my head is like, there's um, Emma is the singer from She, Her, Hers, but also plays in a band called uh, Chatterbox and the Latter-day Satanists. John Worm, who's the singer uh, for Rent Strike, uh, also plays in the band Chatterbox and the Latter-day Satanists. And then one of the female singers of that band is also the female singer in uh, Chad Haste George. So there's a lot of like, I don't know, a lot of cro uh, crossover and, and stuff, um, you know, especially within like a more localized uh, music scene. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. It's definitely not something that I've, uh, I mean, I'm aware of like the, the um, authoritarian uh, historical kind of censorship uh, that occurred, but I am curious, like, what's sort of like the idealized, uh, op more optimistic manifestation of art under a state like this, um, and or I guess it would be, would it be considered stateless if it's anarcho-communism? Yeah, that, I mean, that's that's the idea of it. Uh, the biggest, the biggest um, 
hold back for like a art artistic creation is just that uh, you don't really have the, the distribution that you know a lot of these other figures have. I think it was on uh, the, you're familiar I think with um, Steven Crowder. Yes. The <laughs> conservative commentator Steven Crowder. I, I think I saw in like Majority Report or something like that, he spends like $6,000 a month on Facebook ads alone. Oh like, my God. geez, that's, <laughs> I could practically live on that money and you just spend <laughs> it on Facebook ads. So, yeah. you know, uh, it's quite the uphill battle with, uh, between creators um, like myself, just working out of, you know, their apartment and their limited resources compared to some of these other, you know, figures, your, um, you know, Dave uh, Rubens and your, you know, Prager U's and whatever that have mm -hmm. these uh, deep pockets behind them. Now, do you think, because uh, I was thinking about this, especially in the middle of the pandemic, when everyone was just at home and we all just had like TikTok um, and there's like there was something I'm still trying to form a complete opinion on this. But the idea that there's this like uh, 16 year old girl who basically controls the music industry almost as well as the billboard uh, or like, you know, even like you're saying, like musicians, like overly advertising. I know they they do it on like YouTube. They'll buy views and stuff like that. But that this like Charlie D'Amelio can literally wake up and choose a random song and dance to it. And then that song will all of a sudden become like a um, like a number one single. And, it, you know, and there, I have noticed with TikTok, there's like a more obscure artists gaining recognition because of trends and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I'm wondering if it's if, if it's almost like an acceleration of what's already been happening or if it's like a, kind of a deviation from it. Like it's actually it's going back to just people uh, deciding what's actually a, um, what they actually would want, I guess. Like it's becoming more um, consumer uh, from the point of the consumer. It's driven from that point. Um, but then at the same time, I guess you could make the argument that the... Um, consumers own desires and uh, uh, interests are being shaped by the system that they're within. Yeah, yeah. So I think that like, you know, the popularity of things trending on, on TikTok or really potentially any uh, social media platform like that is, is quite a bit more bottom up than say like the record company paying um, to get the, this song more radio play or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what it, what it kind of makes me think of is sometimes I would ask people, you know, um, someone like ContraPoints, like a, this like left wing content creator on YouTube, probably wouldn't get on mainstream news. But also, mm -hmm. someone like Steven Crowder like doesn't get on mainstream news. Like, is it is it better? Are we happy with this more decentralized thing where we get kind of the more extremes on either side, um, getting? Um, a lot of voice and being able to reach a lot of people or is it better to have this more centralized thing but then there it's so much more limited in the uh, scope of expression i think that um it, it, it's hard to say part of me wants to think like yeah when something blows up on TikTok, like that's so totally completely organic and you know um noam chomsky's manufacturing consent be damned like this isn't being you know uh contorted in any way this is purely you know, the people deciding, like, I like this sound. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I wonder, like, well, people, you know, are products of their environment and stuff. And when we, we grow up listening to the types of songs that are, like, in commercials or in movies and stuff, and, we, and what becomes popular, you know, breeds kind of monotony because then everyone's liking the same song. Um, hmm. I used to, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take this in a slightly different direction, actually. So I used to think when, when I was in um, high school, people dressed like very distinctly. There was like, you know, people that dressed goth with like all the buckles and the snaps and stuff. And then punk people with giant mohawks and uh, mm. the, the scene uh, kids with like candy bracelets all on their arms and stuff. And I wondered, I wondered like, oh, it seemed like that stark difference between like cliques as a teenager like slowly went away and everything kind of blended into just like sameness but i feel like i'm almost seeing that come back you know i'm seeing stuff on tiktok or whatever where people are doing uh, you know crazy hair color and, and makeup you know uh, designs on their on their face and stuff i feel like uh this sort of ground up you know building of, of things that are popular and building of trends is is causing um, a lot more difference in in uh, a lot more options flavors and representation that you can find in media i i'd like to think
Yeah, no, that's well put. I, I think it's like it boils down to with like radicalism and counterculture in general, there actually needs to be a culture or mainstream for it to be considered radical or counterculture. Oh, and I yeah. guess I think like uh, Zizek talks about like uh, like there is like the necessity of the other um, even if it's like you you hate the other it needs it needs to be there in some form mm-hmm. um, and I, I, I kind of see that the one kind of main opposition to this is the fact that corporations and mainstream entertainment are becoming um, more and more uh, I guess intelligent and and will quickly adopt uh, or adapt with whatever uh, sort of countercultural movement there is, um, and that could that could pose a threat because it's almost getting to the point where it, it like it is that sameness. It's getting hard to actually feel like you are being yourself because even if you do genuinely feel like you're uh, uh, an individual or you're making a difference, then all of a sudden you actually see that this is a very mainstream thing. You don't really feel like that's special, um, but then you could go and attach your beliefs and identity to another trend but then you realize that's been co-opted by like another corporation um so there is this it seems all very like transitory like counterculture because it's constantly uh having to readapt to this uh very uh quick um and intelligent system of of adoption by by the main mainstream whatever the mainstream is or the industry yeah i'm terrified by that prospect uh i I think about it quite a bit there's a book maybe you're familiar with called capitalist realism oh by uh, by mark fisher Fisher. right yeah yeah and in that you know he talks about for example like uh kurt cobain would you know lament that it's like every um every radical thing like he would try to do was like practically you know bought and sold prior to him doing it you know like Mm -hmm. whatever thing he was going to do like they were already going to like make money off of that concept That Mm -hmm. I find terrifying. Another concept in that book related that I find terrifying is uh, what's called interpassivity, which is that like, you know, my desires to create some sort of like uh, revolutionary body that fights the system or something is pacified by things like watching uh, Snowpiercer or by playing uh, the Watch Dogs like video games. And I play those and I act out or I, or I watch the movie and you know, in my mind I act out this revolutionary thing and it pacifies me uh, mm. by doing that. It's um, a bit like, like when people would go and watch like gladiators uh, like yeah. fight in Rome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bread and, bread and circuses and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but speaking to like the, the co-opting of like all you know, radical ideas and you know, Colin Kaepernick in the Nike commercial and you know, the banks with like Black Lives Matter banners and things like this. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Anthony Fantano was talking about, I think he was talking about maybe Marilyn Manson or or Slipknot or something like that. And he said, you know, when I was a kid, I would print off pictures of these musicians and show them to my parents and and scare them with, you know, this this freak with like a colored, you know, contact lenses and like a fishnet shirt and stuff, you know, these freaky people. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's so like whatever you know we we have everything like that now um yeah. that's that's nothing new i can look at um you know people uh who get songs that are popular on tiktok and their music video is like they're bald and blood and guts or something and it's supposed to be this shocking imagery but like is it anymore has it all been have we tapped all those <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah you know has has it all you know, nothing new under the sun and all that yeah i mean that's uh there's like certain times where there's something that enters the mainstream um, that also does seem like refreshing. Like the two things I can kind of think of for me personally was um, the This Is America video by uh, Childish Gambino and yeah, then, yeah. Uh, Inside recently by Bo Burnham where it's like these are, you know, whether you agree with the, the message, th- this seems like it's a... Uh, it's very refreshing. There's something very refreshing about it. It's like there is still ground that can be covered. And there is always like a a historical kind of, um, you could go back to any point in history and there's always someone saying like, oh, we've done it all. Like this is, this is kind of the end, end point of at least creativity or creation. Um, but I understand the fear because it's it's the speed at which um, everything is happening now. Like there is no shock factor anymore because 
we can literally see anything we want at any time with like a few clicks um and anything you've done is it's probably been done before which is kind of discouraging yeah i mean like especially with something so like with with something like movies maybe there's a little bit more of a higher bar on what kind of things you can have already been done but with something as accessible as uh music or writing or something like really it's really you can't like oh i'm going to write a book from the perspective of a uh, cockroach that's probably been mm-hmm. done you know i'm going to create um an example i often look to is like the the anti music uh genre you know that's like tr- purposely trying to really deconstruct music in such a way that they have like really harsh feedback for like five minutes and then like a blast beat and then like you know whatever it's like it's all it's all been done like any possible thing you could think of um mm-hmm. that uh the clown core uh guys that were like on adult swim or something where it's the two clowns and one guy's playing keyboard and drums and the other guy's playing saxophone but it's like this math core breakdown that's been done now <laughs> <laughs> the 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 genre of two clowns playing four instruments yeah. doing breakdown beat that's done now that's that, so yeah um, it's interesting what you say about this is America because even though and I go back and I I watched that music video actually quite recently and like I look at it fondly at the time when it came out I think it it was at a time when I was um, listening to a, a hip hop group called like Dead Prez is like a very political uh, hip hop group or Low Key or Logic or Immortal Technique or something. Mm-hmm. And I was listening to these, these groups a lot. I'd been listening to them for maybe like two or three years at the time. And then this video comes out and people are like, oh, political music is cool actually. And I was like jaded, you know, oh, I've been listening, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, you know, uh, Dead Prez does concerts at colleges where cop cars get flipped over. You know, are you kidding me? Yeah. This, is, <laughs> this is nothing. But I, I felt the same way. I, I'm, uh, maybe it's a product of, you know, like the, the generation or whatever that I'm that I'm easily you know cynical and, and jaded and such. Um, when uh, Lady Gaga wore a battle jacket in one of her music videos and it had like Doom and other like crust punk patches on it, a mm-hmm. lot of my friends and stuff were like, yeah. you know, ugh. And then Forever Twenty One and stuff all of a sudden is selling denim vests with ripped off <laughs> sleeves and, and studs and all my punk friends are like oh geez you know here we go again but 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 that's kind of the that's the core of being counterculture though and it, and it's like a requirement almost because it would be bad if if you had a more kind of positive reaction in a sense like seeing like the mainstream kind of a uh, co-opt or or just just see these things celebrated because you don't you don't want them to be celebrated you want them to because you know they're not being celebrated exactly for uh, like a utilitarian purpose or like to actually fix these problems. It's being celebrated because um, it kind of resonates with people broadly, but it's not really going to. There's a feeling that it's not going to really move things enough as maybe a more like radical art group. But then at the same time, a radical art group wouldn't survive because it tries to move things so quickly. Um, to the point where it could be terrifying for a large enough audience. Yeah, yeah. There's this. Um, there, I've I've heard this before that there's this line in artistic creation you have to draw between being something that is you know purely your own personal expression relatable to you, versus you have to have some appeal. Like there has to be something in what you're creating that like a, would bring an audience to watch it. So yeah. you know, um, uh, sorry to bother you is an awesome interesting fascinating story that like a lot of um you know left-leaning and like working class people can like watch and really like see themselves in this story it's maybe a little bit too controversial to get like the big mainstream appeal of like like i said a marvel movie but at the same time it got it got uh the interest of capital enough that there was an editing crew and there was Mm -hmm. cameras you know it had professional production um, so it was at least, you know, um, uh, what's, what's the line? Like, uh, the capitalist will sell you the rope to hang themselves, you know, with. It was, <laughs> it was at least appealing enough to capitalism that they're willing to completely fund, you know, this, this movie. Um, well, it's, yeah. No, despite its messaging or, or whatever. I, w- I was talking about this in a previous episode that, um, at least in psychology, one of the kind of basic general ways they try to like quantify or describe creativity is that there's like novelty so there's like something unique peculiar like the two clowns thing but then 
there's also because like most people will say like oh i'm so creative i'm so imaginative but that's actually a little bit different because imaginative can be you you could just be random you could just be coming up with random things doing random things what you're talking about is there's also like another component to creativity in this like traditional definition that is um, utility or um, social appropriateness which is it does need to actually appeal so that that's why i find well, like this is America or inside like these pieces very interesting because it's like they they do seem to actually resonate on kind of a deeper level about certain topics not generally addressed in the mainstream but yeah. at the same time you could like show it to your like mom and dad and like they'll like find it interesting or they'll be like oh this is so cool like it's a or you just like listen to it and it's um you don't need to have like a some high level degree or had to have read a lot of um, books uh, to to appreciate it, um, which which kind of makes me wonder: is this are are these kind of a midpoint uh, creative like uh, art projects that have mainstream appeal but are also somewhat radical or somewhat? Um, at least demonstrative in, in their political messaging, social messaging, um, would they be better or worse than um, full-on radical art becoming kind of mainstream in in uh, producing whatever sort of political effect um, or product or consequences you would you would want to see come from them? Oh, that, that's a big one. That's hard yeah. to say. <laughs> um, oh man, that's. Uh... That's hard to say. I'm reminded there's a st- there's a movie. I think it's called either Broken Glass or Breaking Glass. It might be called Breaking Glass, but it's about uh, this British band in like the '70s, and it's essentially kind of supposed to be a story about some a band like Crass or something mm-hmm. like a very very anarchist uh, project. And they get their start and they start getting popular. But over the course of the story, they go from being this. Um, you know, purely anarchist, crass type band to kind of becoming a little bit more of this um, David Bowie synth type thing that's popular at the time. Mm-hmm. And it's just you're watching this uh, this trajectory from being them playing their concerts like at protests to the artist, um, the lead singer is like gaunt. You know, they're they're dead inside. They've been you know <laughs> sucked dry by the, the music industry, and they're wearing this sort of. Um, you know this 70s glam rock outfit and playing on this huge stage mm. um so as complicated as the question that is i'll just say that movie exists hopefully that answers <laughs> the question <laughs> yeah i know that yeah because i mean I, I guess it's uh at the end of the day it's it's like a risky line to uh to go through because the more the more success the more uh inevitable almost it is that you're going to be corrupted or some of your values might be kind of uh just maybe not destroyed but at least pacified um so that kind of radicalism might might disappear but and i think it goes in i think it goes in both directions i mean a lot of punk uh people for example will look at something like green day and it's like mm-hmm. oh they sold out they went major label they lost their way, they lost their roots, their songs like aren't about anything anymore or whatever. But at the same time, other folks will come from the other side and like, well, but Green Day used that uh, popularity and that footing to do shows where they would let lesser known bands, or not let, but like have the lesser known bands open for them and stuff, or they would place these smaller venues to bring attention to them. You know, hmm. so you can do, uh, you know, you can take that that influence and in the, in the eyeballs on on you, and then direct that energy, you know, in, in positive ways. So it's sort of a, a double edged sword or something. Mm. Yeah. So kind of like sharing the success to your origins or your roots a little bit, and trying to have that community grow, even if you yourself can't recreate that that sort of spark. That's that's an interesting way. Or even uh, Kurt Cobain did that. He wore like a Daniel Johnson like shirt and stuff. He would wear shirts of these like lesser known bands. Oh, that's cool. You know. Um, oh, he was a he was a Daniel Johnston fan. Uh, I believe he like wore a shirt like in an interview, and that's why Daniel Johnston got to play at like this MTV thing or whatever. Oh, that's cool. Huh. Yeah, I mean it's so yeah, it's like I I could I can personally begrudge you know, um, uh, Kurt Cobain for popularizing and and being like whatever a sellout and stuff, but at the same time you know he did things uh, with that power and reach that uh, I think are very. Um, admirable and we can say the same for things like you know this is america and um inside 
um, and a lot of these other projects that, you know, I'm very glad they exist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're bringing people, you know, to some ideas that they aren't read. What's that, uh, what's that um, tweet someone did that was like, oh, why did I learn about Black Wall Street from an HBO show instead of like my high school history class? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, well, I, that's, I was talking about some, I was talking about this with some uh, friends, but it's almost like uh, when you have a, like if you went into like a humanities degree or something like that beforehand in the last like last decade or a little bit before that, it was just seen as like you're not really going to get a job, you're not going to be employed. But now it's like you can actually just make a YouTube channel and you can talk about all these things and you're like providing people with like a far better and more kind of specialized education about these topics than they would have ever gotten like high school or some like college courses. Yeah, totally. Hey, I, um, I had a I had a sort of um, philosophical question. I was interested to pick your brain about. I was kind of thinking what we would talk about and rummaging okay. <laughs> through my brain of uh, questions that I've that I've asked myself. Do you happen to have any um, speaking here as a dog? Do you happen to have any uh, non-human you know companions living like with you or? Or with friends uh, or whatnot? I, uh, uh, not in, because I'm back in my apartment in Montreal, but, um, I, uh, it, like where my parents live, we have, um, two pets. We have a Labradoodle named Poppy, um, who she's getting a little bit older. I think she's like seven or eight years old now. Um, oh, and, don't say that's old. That's how old I am. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah, sometimes I forget you're a dog. It's uh, you just you're very articulate, I guess. I don't know if that's offensive to dogs in general, but yeah, Pe people <laughs> ask how it works, and it's kind of like there's a uh, an episode of Goosebumps where the where the uh, kids turn into dogs and they and they speak to each other telepathically. <laughs> it basically kind of works like that. You know? Oh, I remember that. Yeah, they turn, and in the end, like they find out that the doctor was like kind of it was like some sort of experiment or something. Like he was actively trying to turn them into dogs. Oh, so good. Anyway, sorry, and then you had one other uh, animal friend? Oh, yeah, then it's a, it's a leopard gecko named Fred, who is, like, not, like, barely a pet, and uh, we used to have two, and he killed the the other one, and, uh, yeah, it's, but he's interesting. He's, like, extremely old. They can live for a very long time, um, and they can, they're very, like, tough. Like, they'll, they'll survive in a lot of different conditions, um, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend one as, like, a pet, I guess. It's a lot to uh, take on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, thought, I've thought about, so I'll, I will get to my question eventually, but I have thought like there almost seems to be this spectrum of, um, of animals in the house where something like a dog or a cat, they're basically living within your environment, whereas mm. something like fish especially, but like birds or like a gecko or something, you have to create their own environment for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a little, a little bit, bit of more of like you know, you're creating a biome versus having like a roommate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's uh maybe that's how we will define sentience <laughs> from now on. Is <laughs> so, so my uh, getting to my question here is I, I've been kind of thinking. You know, we have this uh, global warming and stuff. It's been on everyone's you know mind, maybe slowly more so and more so since like the '70s or something. Mm -hmm. And in this way, household pets are kind of. Um, it's like Stockholm syndrome or something. They're, they're just along for the ride, really. They didn't choose. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if they had all the information available to them, if they had, um, you know, the context, what it would mean for the future, what it means for the present, whatever, if they would choose, yes, I want civilization. I want central heating, air conditioning, packaged food that's like uh, FDA approved. I want all of that even if it means global warming and destruction of the planet, you know, if they could push a button that makes, you know, red pill, blue pill, push a button that mm -hmm. makes the current society continue to exist. Or if they would say, you know, this is, you know, asinine, we should go back to return to monkey, you know. Uh, yeah. I would be much happier, you know, uh, fending for myself and sleeping in a cave if it meant that, you know, life on the, on the planet would exist more equitably, you know, we wouldn't have... Um, this world of, of central heating, air conditioning, and packaged food built on, you know, sweatshops and slavery and exploitation mm -hmm. of the, you know, the third, and all of this, right? That what, what do you think like a household pet would, would choose if being able to recognize the, the complexity and everything involved in making that choice, which would they choose, I wonder? Um, I mean, I think that it's a very good way to reflect on 
human decision making in this. I, I do think that a large part of the climate crisis is due to the fact, um, and it's a very kind of plain fact, that our average life expectancy is around like uh, 70 years. And I do wonder sometimes what the world would be like if we lived to 150 or 200 years. Um, would we have a larger preoccupation, or I guess I, I think we would have a larger preoccupation over the um, the future, and it would extend uh, and perhaps not uh, mitigate climate change uh, to like the degree where it's like not a problem, but I think it would postpone it because I think we would be more actively caring about uh, our kids and the world that we live in because I think it is hard for us to imagine what the world will be like once we pass on. So there is that kind of comforting, um, oh, we could just live in this like industrialized place. And I, I think there's some resentment between, you know, the, the boomer and zoomer uh, like <laughs> trend that like the boomers probably won't have to actually live the worst of this. And we likely will have to live through at least, you know, hopefully the beginning of the worst of this, but, you know, potentially the worst of this. Um, and the fact that household pets... Um, generally don't live that long unless you have like a, a tortoise um, <laughs> yeah, as yeah. a pet um i feel or some of these uh, tropical birds can live to be like a hundred or something yeah they'll be like the wise <laughs> the wise ones but i do feel like especially if you told them like uh it would be the equivalent of of telling us like oh uh you know 50 to 80 years after you die the world will become like uninhabitable um, I think that they would have to take that into account. It would be, you know, in human years, it would be five to ten years uh, after you you die, um, which would be a lot of time for, like, a dog or something like that. That's, like, a whole lifetime. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think it's not even philosophically speaking. I, I do think, and I guess it, it uh, maybe reveals uh, a little bit of my own idea of, of human nature, not that we're, like, selfish, but that we're, fairly like lazy and um we tend to just pacify ourselves when when problems uh, arise and perhaps yeah, what's, the, what's the old saying is like um uh we only change when the uh pain of not changing exceeds the fear of changing something yeah like that. yeah well like i do think there's that david foster wallace quote about um taking your life and that you know he's trying to give it the perspective of you know it's not like they just like it's not like this urge to do it or this like uh, this selfish act to do it. It's the equivalent of when you're in like a house that's bur or in a, like a tall building that's burning down and you can either burn to death or you can jump because it's like the, the kind of the depression and suffering becomes so intolerable that the, the only other option is, is sort of to plunge into nothingness. Um, and I think that is potentially uh, going to be a collective issue in the next uh, 10 to 30 to 40 years, uh, depending on how quickly things accelerate, where it's how intolerable are we going to let things happen? Uh, the chances that we've already kind of let the tipping point pass, uh, for me personally, feels like, you know, we've, we've kind of messed that up. Like, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of mitigation that can happen now. Um, so, so we're going to have, it's going to be a lot of more collective kind of existential questions that arise. Um, how do you manage mass migration and probably the um, this growing xenophobia as people mm. of different races and locations uh, migrate to uh, and you know there's going to be resource problems um, there's going to be probably a more radical um, leaders on both sides of the spectrum uh, arising because like like you were kind of saying like the more radical of a problem the more radical of a solution um mm -hmm. yeah so yeah that i mean that's my kind of idea i but i guess i'm wrong because you are a dog and you chose anarcho-communism <laughs> i don't know <laughs> dogs are naturally anarcho-communist and, and cats are naturally like anarcho-capitalists i think <laughs> 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 I can see that. I, that doesn't even need any explanation. I just <laughs> I understand. <laughs> yeah. What what I think what I think that our future might look like. Something that I often say is I think our future will very likely look like the movie Interstellar, and mm. not with the super cool intergalactic travel. I think that that's never going to happen. Uh, but right. I think um, the dust storms and the living off of corn because tropical foods no longer exist. 
is mm -hmm. you know potentially and you just kind of you adapt to the uh, the new normal you mm -hmm. know um you uh you missed your bill and you don't have internet for the week and you uh, you adapt to the new normal you lose you know your hand in a, a car accident or an accident at work and you just you know your life isn't over and you you drown in misery you know you just sort of adapt to to what's happening and i i think that adapting to a lack of you know tropical fruits and, and things like that is potentially our future yeah yeah no like i mean it's it's like if you told someone like two years ago that um you're going to live through like a worldwide pandemic that sounds like an absolutely apocalyptic uh terrifying thing that you would not want to have happen and most of us are through it and it is uh, there was a lot of tragedy and suffering and deaths um for those that were touched by it uh personally um but there were also a lot of people where it came and went and it was just a lot of time spent uh, sitting at your at your home and initially it was probably quite boring but I, I do feel like we've collectively adapted to it um, and you know there, I, I think I think you're right there's going to be an exponential growth of kind of pandemics natural disasters uh, mm -hmm. worsening climate and uh, we will nonetheless probably just adapt to it um, you kind of just adapt or die which is <laughs> the <laughs> perhaps the slogan of of the next uh, century but <laughs> oh, God. Uh, um, sorry hey, i sprained my i sprained my ankle playing basketball the other day so i guess i'm just in a more uh, cynical mood <laughs> i've been hopping around the apartment so <laughs> i um i broke uh my leg in a car accident a few years ago and then broke the other leg in a mosh pit like the very next year so oh, i spent geez. like this. Uh, I'm like, oh, how come I couldn't have broken like my finger on like, <laughs> you know, or you know, toe bean, I should say, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it could be very debilitating. Uh, one thing that I wanted to touch on actually, because you were bringing up like the um, our sort of limited generational scope in which we kind of think about, you know, uh, and we plan for the future and stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, I was listening to this uh, interesting debate between uh, Ward Churchill and the Whale Wars guy, whose name I forget, mm -hmm. uh, but the Whale Wars guy. And the Whale Wars guy was talking about how, uh, talking about the same thing, that we have this very, like, one generation, maybe, degree of separation between how we think of, uh, you know, we think about our parents and maybe sometimes think about our grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, that's not always been the case. And there's been tribal, you know, cultures and stuff like that around Native America, for example, where thinking six or seven generations into the past was very normal. Um, mm -hmm. And because of that, uh, because of the normalcy of that, thinking six to seven generations into the future, you know, was also normal. You would think, you know, what kind of person do I want to be? Uh, what kind of stories will my, you know, great, 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 great grandkids and nieces and nephews tell about me uh, with, the, with the one life that I have. Um, maybe we will get back to that sort of state of being again, um, how things go, I'm not sure. Well, I know, I know what you mean. It's almost like a deterioration of the uh, significance of a legacy or sur surviving in, in some non-physical way past your death. Uh, like Ernest Becker's Denial of Death really talks about how that's one of the ways we kind of um, cope with the fact that we're one of the um, only animals that can think about our own deaths at any point in time. And just, you know, we could be working on something, we could be doing the dishes, we could be, um, you know, with a loved one, and then we could just remember that it's all just kind of like futile because it just it just ends eventually. It doesn't really lead up to anything. Um, yeah, we could be like sitting and recording a podcast and think about how futile your life <laughs> no, this, is and everything's meaningless. This this is the one thing that... Uh, will have an impact <laughs> this one <laughs> podcast no but uh um but he, like one of the ways is is like legacy building it's that you kind of have a life project or you um you know in the past you you live very virtuously um in the hopes that you know um not even in like a narcissistic way but just this kind of general symbolic sense that this is how you honor your your future family and um i think that's being like torn down like i don't i don't at least at least in like industrialized um countries like i'm in canada where it's just i don't know none of us really think that far ahead <laughs> like, like it's not it's not really a concern now now it just seems like you want to get like famous really quickly or have some sort of uh 
popularity like well you're alive oh my god is, what yeah. what you're oh man what you're saying is making me so I, i'm thinking in the these two directions right there's the mm -hmm. uh, that saying that's like um you die twice you know you die your natural death and then you die like the last time someone says your name mm -hmm. right that common that common thing well i've been re-watching futurama and on re-watching <laughs> it it's actually better than rick and morty i think you know it's, oh uh, i was thinking i always compare bangers, the two but there's yeah. some good ones some really good yeah. ones I agree. Uh, yeah. Uh, and one of the ones in there is uh, Fry takes a video of um, Leela's butt wart singing a song, and it goes viral. Mm. And then to like make her feel better, he falls into like a vat of like vomit or something, and then his video <laughs> goes viral, and then everyone forgets who she is. Right. And that's like that's the new. It used to be you die your organic death, and then you die the last time someone says your name. But now it's like uh, all through your natural life, you die a little after your viral tweet goes away mm -hmm. or your viral video goes yeah. away you die a little it's yeah we're, death. we're accelerating symbolic death almost mm -hmm. yeah yeah no I, I i think a lot of the things we've touched on kind of goes back to the uh, limitations of just human attention not even saying that somebody's uh, selfish or self-interested or if somebody's incredibly altruistic and community oriented but just that we can't seem to really, uh, we, we just kind of just gravitate towards novelty and peculiarity. And, uh, you know, this, this can be existentially bad for us if we're on the receiving end and we want to become a product that uh, outlasts us, in a sense, and, and a product in a very like capitalist uh, way. Uh, but at the same time, the, the attention, the human attention that would be needed to actually um, bring forth any sort of real radical political change um, seems to be, at least for me, I'm somewhat cynical of, of that idea, um, especially when it looks like the way the world is now is, is it would be extremely difficult to kind of rebel against um, this ever-growing system of like global capital and uh, uh, data, data collection and, and so forth. Well, may, may the uh, may we pray that the uh, the servers that this podcast is stored on be, you know, discovered maybe in forty years after the collapse of you know mankind and stuff, and then it, it becomes cataloged as you know one of the few remnants of the the pre collapse time. <laughs> yep. No, and, and I mean they're going to be very confused about why like thirty minutes in you revealed that you were a dog, but. Um. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I, do you have anything else uh, to add? I, we we could probably just keep talking for like hours, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm for, sure we could. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> for length. yeah, um, no, this was this was great. I'd I'd be you know if you I don't know if you ever have repeat guests, but at, at some points you know in the future, I I hope that we will collab on a, a book review or or something. You know, I imagine we will, uh, you know. Oh yeah, no, no, yeah. I'm, I'm totally down. Yeah, <laughs> and no other niceties. Yeah, of course. No, it was it was really nice to talk to you. Um, thank you for educating me on anarcho-communism. Um, and yeah, please check out uh, Radical Reviewers' uh, channel. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for thank you for having me, everyone uh, listening. You know, have a have a great day. The world is gonna end soon, apparently. That's <laughs> the note that we're ending on. <laughs> so think about think about your multiple existential you know deaths as a social you know something that exists in social media and then eventual death of yourself in the <laughs> ecological collapse anyway have a good day